Thank you, Selby. Dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry, I extend a warm welcome to the online interaction on multi-pronged strategies to rebuild tourism and travel organized by IMC's Travel, Tourism and Hospitality Committee. A very special thanks and welcome to our moderator, Mr. Mandeep Lamba, President, South Asia, HVS, Anarok, and guest speakers, Ms. Rupen Tarbrar, IRS, Additional Director General, Tourism, Ministry of Tourism, Government of India, Mr. Sijit Vichaksono, Director of Tourism, Marketing, East, South, Central Asia, Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy, Republic of Indonesia, Ms. Kimar Lee Fernando, uh, <clears throat> Chairperson, Sri Lanka Tourism, Mr. Nishan Kashikar, Co Country Director, India and Gulf Tourism Australia, Mr. Sisi Surampan, Director, Tourism Authority of Thailand, and Mr. Rohit Kosla, Executive Vice President Operational, North West India, the Indian Hotels Companies Limited, for sparing their valuable time and being with us today. The event is being organized with the support of the Indian Hotels Company Limited and Concept Hospitality Private Limited, the Fern Hotels and Resorts. I also take this opportunity to acknowledge BW com Communities as our esteemed media partners for the event. Around the world, in countries at all development levels, many millions of jobs and businesses are dependent on the strong and thriving tourism sector. Tourism has been the driving force in protecting natural and cultural heritages, preserving them for future generations to enjoy. As per WTTC, during 2019, contribution by travel and tourism to India's GDP was 6.8% of, to of the total economy and supported 39.8 million jobs, which is almost 8% of our total employment. The devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the global tourism has carried on into 2021, with new data showing an 87% fall in international tourism arriving in January as compared to 2020. The outlook for the rest of the year remains cautious as the World Tourism Organization continues to call for stronger coordination on travel protocols between countries to ensure the safe restart of tourism and avoid another year of massive losses for the sector. India is one of the most digitally advanced traveler nations in terms of digital tools being used for planning, booking, and experiencing a journey. India's rising middle class and increasing disposable income has supported the growth of domestic and outbound tourism. However, with the a recent fresh surge of coronavirus infection has put once again the hospitality and tourism industry under renewed stress, which was just beginning to feel optimistic about business prospects with the rollout of the vaccination drive. Revenue is less than 50% of the pre-COVID times and footfalls are declining. We need to ensure that the hospitality and tourism industry in future is future ready to tap all the potential growth opportunities and also to safeguard its against all kinds of crisis situation, including natural disasters and pandemics. The objective of today's interaction is to have leaders from the travel and tourism industry from India, Australia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and Thailand to have a dialogue and share their learnings and measures taken by each nation to rebuild tourism and enhance regional coordination for a sector that is going through its darkest hours in recent history. We at IMC are confident that today's online interaction would be beneficial to the travel, tourism, and hospitality community as this crisis is an opportunity to rethink tourism for the future. Tourism is at a crossroad and the measures put in place today will reshape the tourism for tomorrow. Government across the world need to consider the longer term implications of, on the crisis while 
capitalizing on digitalizing, supporting the low carbon transition, and promoting the structural transformation needed to build a stronger and more sustainable and resilient tourism, tourism economy. The travel and tourism industry has gone through a crisis before and fought back. The truth is that the pandemic is temporary and shall pass. However, it would lead to shaking up the industry with consolidation, synergization, and innovation being the new mantra. We have no doubt that the sector will bounce back stronger and play an important role in our economic growth and development. Before I end, a few words about IMC. Established in 1907 and having its headquarters in the heart of the city of Mumbai, the IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry is an apex chamber of commerce, trade and industry, having a member base of over 5,000 members and 150 associations affiliated to it. Together, it represents and advocates the interest of over 4 lakh businesses and industry establishments across the country from diverse sectors of industry. I once again welcome you all to this insightful session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pardar. I now request Mr. Farhad Jamal, Chairman, IMC Travel, Tourism and Hospitality Committee to present the introductory address. Over to you, Mr. Jamal. Thank you, President Todar. Uh, and I must say a big thank you to all our panelists who found time for this very important panel discussion for travel and tourism. And I'm deeply grateful on behalf of MC. The idea behind this online dialogue with tourism leaders from various nations was to explore how we can work, work together, build joint multi-pronged strategies to rebuild tourism. Intra-regional, inter-regional cooperation holds enormous promise for growth in this sector. By developing synergy, we can promote the vast range of tourist destinations and offerings that ASEAN countries, South Asian countries, and countries as far as, as Australia have. And, uh, and how we can promote those destinations. And as a part of that, I think it's also going to help the economic growth, social integration, and of course, employment generation opportunities in these countries. The latest figures, if I remember correctly, when South Asia itself would see loss of 50 million jobs and, it, and uh, about $50 billion loss in GDP in, our, in the South Asia region. So the devastation is huge. Post COVID, Travel competition will be huge and it will be critical to enhance regional cooperation, collaboration, not just to battle the virus, but to build back together, avoid large scale, avoid large scale discounting, ease visa restrictions, but to build back together, to build back together and deregulate and improve communications and advocacy to policymakers uh, and, uh, and for the travelers. We believe focus on intra-regional travel and sharing lessons learned in simpler informal regional partnerships, whether it is intergovernmental or private sector tourism organizations, is much easier. We are confident to get some brilliant ideas to this end towards the close of this session. At the IMC Chamber of Commerce, through its Travel, Tourism and Hospitality Committee, as the President has rightly said, we strongly believe that time is ripe to deliberate on how to build a robust and committed regional tourism action plan that will hopefully provide the much needed ray of hope to travel and tourism industry and pull it out of its present miserable state and provide wings for it to take off sooner than we can imagine and beat all pessimistic predictions of, of uh, a gloomy future based on the data forecasts that get churned out week on week, month on month. And I really hope and I believe this is going to come true. Uh, now I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished panelists in no particular order, but ladies first. Uh, Ms. Rupinder Panu Brar is the Indian Revenue Service Officer from 1990 batch. She is additional Director General for Ministry of Tourism, Government of India. She is a graduate in modern history from University of Delhi. She has also done a Master's in Public Administration from Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. Recently, she completed a degree of law in Bombay University and she is enrolled in the Master's degree in Psychology. Ms. Brar is an eternal student. She also has enrolled, uh, she, prior to this, uh, Ministry of Tourism assignment. She was holding charge as commissioner of large taxpayer unit in income tax department in Mumbai. She attended a lot of training programs in India and overseas to hone her work skills. Ms. Brar's interests include reading books of all genres, 
music, experiential cooking, and of course, charu card reading. Ms. Rar has been awarded Finance Minister's Gold Medal in Law, professional training, and a full scholarship for the MPA program at the Lee Kuan uh, Institute, of, Institute of, of Public Policy in Singapore. So welcome, Mr. Bra Ms. Brar. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sirisupam has been at, with the Tourism Authority of Thailand for more than 20 years, an extensive experience working in various divisions, including international relations, Europe, Middle East and Africa market regions, domestic marketing and policy and planning department. Prior to this assignment to head the Tourism Authority of Thailand in, in, in Delhi, he was the director of Southern Market Division, promoting and coordinating Thailand's Southern Market in so-called domestic market. In previous assignments, he has been posted to the Tourism Authority of Thailand Dubai office as deputy director for Middle East since from 2012 to 2016. Nishant Karshikar, uh, welcome, Mr. Sirup Sukum. Mr. Nishant Karshikar is a, has a career, say, a country manager for India and Gulf for Tourism Australia, has a career spanning for two decades spread across marketing and healthcare and nutrition before he shifted gears and became the captain of so called. Tourism Australia. He's been responsible for driving visitations and spend and tourism spent by raising Australia's awareness and appeal to India. Under his leadership, arrivals from India to Australia have more than tripled in uh, last decade to 400,000 visit visitors and have been instrumental in strengthening people to people link in between the two countries. Hailed as a market leader and voted among the top 30 CMOs of India by Internet Mobile Association of India in 2019. He is often invited to speak at uh, various seminars and tourism conclaves. He is uh, a professional cricketer, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not so sure at what professional level. I mean, he plays Ranji Trophy or his club level, but he plays professional cricket and enjoys his food. So he's blessed to have be associated with the country which has got cricket and food going together for, for himself, for themselves. Ms. Ms. Kermali Fernando, Chairperson, Sri Lanka Tourism. Ms. Kermali Fernando is the chairperson of Sri Lanka Tourism, heads the government's four tourism entities, Sri Lanka Tourism Board Development Authority, Sri Lanka Tourism Promotion Bureau, Sri Lanka Conventions Bureau, and Sri Lanka Institute of Tourism and Hotel Management. This is the first time that one chairperson has been appointed for all four brands. She is the first woman in this role. We are really proud of you, Ms. Fernando, for what you have done. Ms. Fernando is an LLB Honours from London School of Economics. And, and political science and is barrister of law at Lincoln's in UK and an attorney at law in Sri Lanka. She is a life member of the Sri Lanka Bar Association and Law Society of Sri Lanka. Ms. Fernando authored Company Law of Sri Lanka, second edition, a definitive reference for book of students for and practitioners of company law in Sri Lanka. In recognition of her achievements, she was awarded Professional Woman of the Year in 2007 and a Woman of Achievement for Banking in 2009. Very warm welcome to you, Ms. Fernando. Ms. Mr. Sijit Vijaksono is the Director of Tourism Marketing for East, South and Central Asia, Minister for Tourism and Creative Economy of the Republic of Indonesia, 2020. Prior to this, he was Director of Tourism for Middle East, South and Central Asia. Uh, Mr. Sijit is a graduate from University of Nagoya in Japan and later did his doctorate in International Cooperation Studies. Welcome to you, Mr. Sijit. Mr. Rohit Khosla is the Executive Vice President of IS of Indian Hotels Company Limited, and leads and oversee, leads and oversees operations to the, of the North, East, and West regions. Mr. Khosla has had various leadership positions within the organizations in India, Yemen, and Maldives, and Sri Lanka. In his current role, Rohit looks after uh, expansive, diverse portfolio over 60 hotels, palaces, and resorts, cutting across brands of Taj, Selections, Vivanta, and Expressions. Mr. Kosla is an executive committee member of Hotel Association of India and SCOL, and also serves as a member of the CIA National Tourism Committee and WTC TTC India, Cha India chapter. He's also the chairman for Tata Network Forum for North India. He's been fel felicitated with numerous industry awards, including Young Hotel Manager, General Manager in 2006, uh, General Manager of the Year in 2006, again by the ITM Institute of Hotel Management and International Achiever of the Year, Year Award by by Pacific Area Travel Writers Association at ITB Berlin in Germany in 2019. Very warm welcome to you, Mr. Kosla. Thank you. Mr. Mandeep Lamba, our moderator today, we are very grateful to him for spending time to moderate this session. Mr. Lamba is the president, as our president said, of, of South Asia of HUS and Iraq, oversees the practice in the region, and is based in New Delhi. Mr. Lamba is a hospitality professional with an established leadership 
track record of 35 years in varied roles in national leading organizations, including 17 years as in CEO position. Mandeep, because Mandeep Lamba has extensive experience in hotel operations, development strategy and hospitality advisory, having worked for companies such as Choice Hotels, IHG, and Radisson Hotels before becoming president of ITC Fortune Hotels in 2001. Mr. Lamba ventured into entrepreneurial stint for eight years, setting up joint venture companies, Donaday Hotel Group UK and Onyx Hospitality Thailand before joining Jung Lexal in 2014 as managing director, Hotel and Hospitality Group South Asia. He is also a member of the Tourism Council of CII in North India and a member of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors UK. Recently, he was featured in Hotelier India's power list as the most respected hoteliers in India, second year in a row. We are very grateful to you, Mr. Lamba, and very warm welcome. Over to you. Before I, before you start the, the panel discussion, may I ask Mr. Bhuvanesh Khanna, CEO of BW Communities, to say a few words, please. Over to you, Bhuvanesh. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, BW Hotelier and Business World are excited to partner with IMC Chambers of Commerce and Industry for this wonderful show uh, that they have put together. Here we have some of the finest minds from the world over, region and India, who can use their influence, good offices and capabilities to help extricate the hospitality, travel and tourism industries from the deepest throes of dis despair. Despair one and now despair two. That has been thrown at us all. Not what anyone would have imagined or ordered. <clears throat> perhaps one of the latest of, of the hospitality, travel and tourism industries, perhaps one of the largest employers in the country and in the subcontinent and is highly capital intensive. Our industry could do with mercy, reliefs and God sent kindness. In the aftermath of the crisis, recovery of tourism in a way that is safe and attractive for tourists and economically viable for the partners will require coordination between countries, various ministries, industries, associations, and at a level not seen before for enhancing regional coordination and regaining its lost glory. We need to redefine tourism strategies for the future. Over to you, Parath and Mandeep. Thank you for having us over as the exclusive media partner. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bhuvnesh. And over to you, Mandeep. Thank you, Farad. Uh, thank you, Bhuvnesh. Um, delighted to be here uh, in this very, very distinguished gathering. Uh, after having uh, heard the introduction of uh, all the panelists, uh, I'm suddenly very nervous um, on the on the stature of the people that I'm going to be uh, speaking to over the next one hour. But regardless, I am going to still try uh, and get a discussion going. Uh, we're going to try and discuss with this absolutely uh, wonderful uh, panel. Uh, on the disruption that COVID has caused the travel and tourism industry uh, in our part of the world, uh, and also on strategies um, that all of us are seeing in trying to reboot tourism uh, and bring it back. So um, let me start um, with our lady guest from our wonderful neighboring destination, Sri Lanka, Ms. Fernando. Um, Sri Lanka was sort of not so badly impacted by the COVID uh, and, um, you know, it managed to contain it. But let's talk about in this first section um, about what was it like all of last year uh, in 2020 and what measures did you take to sort of keep it contained and what sort of measures did the government take to support the travel and tourism industry? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, as you know, Sri Lanka is an island. We have 22 million people. Uh, we've managed it so far, and we don't want to be um, too uh, 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 you know, optimistic or arrogant about this because every day things change. But to date, uh, we've done well, and uh, the recovery rate is 96%, uh, and the fatality rate is 0 0.62. So it's pretty low. Uh, we took uh, COVID every patient very seriously. Um, the PCR testing, contact tracing, quite a strenuous process was used right from the beginning. 
uh, before we had our first, uh, first uh, COVID patient in Sri Lanka, which happened to be a tour guide uh, from the tourism industry uh, who accompanied uh, some Italian tourists. That was our first patient uh, citizen uh, in March. Before that, we already had a COVID task force set up by the president uh, with multi, uh, sort of a multiple uh, sort of cross-functional team involved in the forces as well as the medical profession. I was also uh, part of the team. So about 22 odd people were appointed to set up a quarantine center. So long before we had a patient, we were very well prepared. Uh, what was done was we communicated daily to the, uh, the, to the community, daily, twice a day, to be honest, uh, from the time the first patient was found. Uh, moment the first patient was found, we went to complete lockdown for six weeks. Uh, we were questioned, criticized, uh, debated about that it was too strong, but we were glad we did it uh, because that educated also our people uh, as to what this, you know, we ourselves got ourselves educated on this uh, uh, pandemic. And uh, immediately what we did was as a government was made sure that people realized and was reassured that there was food security. So first we ensured that there was food security, online uh, uh, delivery, all that. We delivered uh, sort of uh, medication, everything to people's homes um, and uh, all essential services were allowed to work. Everything else was closed uh, except uh, agriculture was permitted to continue. So that was the first thing. And then what we did was we started preparing for, we had lots of tourists at that point when we closed. So we had about 87,000 tourists. We assisted them. We coordinated with the airlines, with the embassies and what have you, and set up a 24-hour call center, so assisted them. And then immediately we went into how we could help the industry. We helped the industry to a great extent, but it's never enough. Uh, it is never enough because the impact was devastating. So the monitoriums were given, time was given to pay the electricity bill, water bills, uh, excise, uh, the liquor license was given time to be paid till next the following year. No registration fee, no renewal fee. Guides were given a small allowance, drivers were given a small allowance and so on. I think most of the countries have done all that. Then we looked at what other countries are doing, particularly I looked at Singapore and some of the other countries. And then we localized and made a guideline for Sri Lanka, which runs into about 80 pages, covering all the areas of a hotel with its housekeeping. All the areas were covered, travel agencies, guides, uh, restaurants, so on. And we implemented that process actually in June last year. Right. By May, we already opened for domestic tourism. And we implemented a safe and secure certification process. The KPMG and Ernst & Young will uh, audit you. You get a specific QR code for your hotel. And then we opened up the for international visitors uh, uh, January this year, where we opened up about 350 hotels, uh, different range from boutique to five star to four star, two star, one star, rest houses as well. So now we are fully operational. Tourists are coming in, uh, particularly from uh, the Middle East uh, countries as well as uh, Russia, Ukraine, you know, CIS countries, as well as the Middle East countries, Middle East because of good flight connectivity. So we have, uh, the, from the guests who have arrived, we have about 11 to 12,000 guests who have arrived for the last few weeks. Uh, we've had less than 1% COVID positive patients. So we have a very detailed protocol in place and a bio bubble concept in place, uh, which has worked right. quite well so far. Right, wonderful. <laughs> Sigit, can I move over to you? Um, Indonesia, of course, is a much, much larger country and uh, it had a serious amount of impact from COVID. I think over 1.5 million cases uh, in Indonesia. So briefly, can you tell us um, what you did last year and uh, what did the government do to sort of support and, uh, you know, get tourism um, a little settled in the very, very unsettled environment? Okay, thank you very much. First of all, on behalf of the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy of the Republic of Indonesia, I would like uh, once again to highly appreciate this uh, event and I uh, would like to share on the point that you just mentioned. Yeah, uh, Of course, as you know that uh, tourism and also the creative economy sector in Indonesia very much uh, suffering because of the pandemic condition. Uh, that is why uh, during the last year, we have done uh, mostly on handling the pandemic. Mr. Sujit, your volume is a little low. Can you just increase that? Hello? 
So bring the loudspeaker to. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I, I, I should put <laughs> this is close. Sorry, once again, I uh, I tell about the how the Indonesian government handling with the pandemic is the most important factor that uh, has been done in 2020 because this is uh, the uh, uh, we, we have been in suffering yeah, for the tourism sector uh, because of this uh, condition and for your information our, we have a new minister at the end of uh, last year and uh, the minister uh, the new the current minister uh, very much uh, concerned on the way we handling the pandemic condition as the, the pre-request side for to revive the sector of tourism uh, including the creative economy and of course uh, yes you can see based on data now the uh, the COVID cases in Indonesia is getting reduced less time by time and the recover number is getting increased day by day and also we focus on uh, destination especially uh, uh, I believe that Indian Indian people know very well about Bali so we focus on uh, Bali the way they handling uh, pandemic especially uh, 2008 because also in consideration if possible if the condition getting better in Bali as our main destination then we will lead to the border opening if possible but with, with the very uh, important condition the way the handling condition of the COVID cases in Bali and we have uh, some uh, also some other things that are very important we do uh, what we call adaptation with CSSE protocol cleanliness health safety and environment sustainability and also in destination covering hotel restaurant and tourist attraction to gain building to uh, build trust yeah for the people uh, to come to visit hotel and also uh, tourist destination and this is not only Bali but uh, apply to all 34 provinces in Indonesia and already started last year within three months we did uh, 5700 certification of CSSE protocol uh, health protocol and right. then we'll continue this April up to June we expect the nation also been implementing this uh, CSSE protocol and of course uh, we'll, we'll, we, we also concern very much on the future of the tourism in Indonesia that is why we also uh, do uh, innovation like what we have done we do uh, still maintain our assistance in the market through our communication strategy we have a collaboration as well with our partner online travel agent as well as also uh, with our media partner so that uh, talk at a little more on, uh, yes talk a little more on rebooting uh, in uh, as we go along further uh, right yes. now, i just want to understand how the last year went by and i think you elaborated okay yeah so okay but before i go further just a quick housekeeping announcement that we will be taking some questions uh, at the end of this discussion so if anybody would like to ask a question from any of the panelists please just put it on the chat box uh, and we'll pick it from there okay moving on uh, kun uh, Chai. you know you know that uh, thailand is our favorite destination uh, and it impacts us equally as it impacts you that uh, we can't travel to Thailand. Uh, but you have done uh, a remarkable job on uh, keeping COVID very controlled. 
uh, with very, very low number of deaths, uh, almost in double digits. Um, that's been a remarkable task. But you obviously have a very significant tourism economy, uh, 40 billion uh, arrivals and 65 billion dollars coming in. Uh, so how have you dealt with this in the previous year and what kind of support has the government provided um, in the last year when the pandemic broke out? Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I just try to be brief and, and quick on this, but first I have to say thank you very much uh, for now. We need to position Thailand as the favorite and trusted destinations. So it's not only favorite, but you know, people have to have confidence in us when they be able to travel as well, right? Looking back last year, okay, um, as you say, Thailand have done quite well, okay? We have a very stringent measures um, 14 days quarantines and real screenings of people coming in. But again, I need to quote uh, what Ms. Fernando have says, situation is changing and it's very difficult to predict. You know, Thailand have, actually Thailand is one of the country outside China, which we see the case since last year in February. We done it well. You know, domestic tourism is back to normal start from May, June. Then we see the second wave, unfortunately, in December, when everyone is expecting to celebrate the New Year's. The second wave is coming in. Then we, we did uh, another stringent measures to control. Things getting better. But now I have to say that is the third wave in the countries. Uh, we try our best to control. What is good about Thailand, I think, is that the people are quite responsible and we doing a very systematic in terms of trace and tracking. So, so now is, we hope things are getting better in Thailand very soon. So this is the situation. Back in terms of tourism, um, in short, okay, as you say, the numbers, tourism regarding nearly 20% of our GDP, direct and indirect. So that's huge. And it's really, you know, it's not just tourism industry, so it's affecting other related as well. So we need to, what we have been doing, in the past, it's like supporting incentive. Uh, during the, we did our lockdown as well last year. Uh, very important is about these skills, you know, our tourism personnel that we have been done, a lot of uh, supporting to save the cost of the um, tourists. First thing first is that when the situation is getting bad, we do the boosting of domestic tourism first, and then we start to prepare to welcome back the international tourism. So last, last year, we still continue to work in terms of international market, like, you know, in, in terms of like uh, creating Thailand to be as the top of my destinations, but we do it in a sentimental way, not too much, but not too low. So this is what we have been done uh, briefly for last year. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Kun uh, Vachirachai. Uh, Nishant, Australia has been sort of like the poster boy, poster girl during COVID on handling of COVID and the cases were sort of very controlled. You've managed to keep it less than 30,000, I think is the number, 29,000 odd uh, till now. And uh, obviously it's uh, one of the lowest uh, population density countries in the world. And that helps because social distancing happens by accident uh, and you don't necessarily need to force anyone to do it. But still, having said that, uh, I think it was a remarkable uh, manner in which the country managed itself, along with, of course, your neighbors in New Zealand. So tell us a little bit about um, how was 2020 and what sort of steps did the government take to support the industry? All right. I guess, uh, first and foremost, a big thank you uh, to IMC for organizing this. And uh, it's an absolute honor and privilege to be a part of this elite panel. To answer your question on the initiatives undertaken by the Australian government during the last 12 months, I guess if there's one Western country that has managed the pandemic really well, uh, that country is Australia. And as you rightly said, you know, there are just less than around 29,000 cases over the past one year in Australia. And uh, the point to note that is that uh, because of the discipline and the efforts of the government, both the federal government and the state government, uh, over the past 30 days, there have been literally zero cases in Sydney and Melbourne due to community transmission. In fact, uh, in the city of Perth or the state of Western Australia, the last case that they had seen due to community transmission was on April 11, 2020. So it's been almost a year since they have not had a single case, single new case due to community transmission in Australia. So 
it's a phenomenal uh, achievement, I must say. And as you again rightly said, social distancing naturally happens in Australia because a country with just a population of 25 million, uh, two and a half times the size of uh, two and a half times the size of India, with a population of just India, uh, with a population of just Mumbai or Delhi, I guess it gets uh, far more easier to control the pandemic than possibly some of uh, you know uh, our countries, uh, for that for that matter. Now, as we speak, everything's open in Australia. Uh, Tourism Australia has launched a campaign called Holiday Year this year to promote domestic tourism. We have launched a campaign called Event Year this year to promote events in Australia. And uh, I guess what has helped us to control the situation and ensure that there are zero COVID cases or rather COVID, achieving a COVID free status has been extensive surveillance, testing, contact, trace, contact tracing, supportive institutional quarantine and compassionate care. I guess is a combination of all these things that have helped us to, to achieve that zero COVID status uh, over the past few months or so. Now, Australia is gradually opening its borders. They're extremely cautious in terms of opening off its borders. On this weekend, they're going to open their borders, the trans tasman borders to New Zealanders. So Australians can travel to New Zealand, New Zealanders can travel to Australia without a vaccine, without a negative RT-PCR test, or without the need to be vaccinated. And that's a great achievement because both Australia and New Zealand have relatively seen zero COVID cases over the past few, past few months or so. In terms of the initiatives undertaken by the Australian government to support the tourism uh, industry, I guess it's been a monumental effort. There was almost close to $46 billion worth of direct government spending for tourism recovery. And let me just take you across various elements of travel. So on the visa front, uh, the Department of Home Affairs has already announced that they'll be waiving off the visa application charge for everyone, for every applicant who was holding a valid visa and was intending to travel to Australia between March 2020, as soon as the lockdown started, and whose visa, visas are going to expire by, say, December 2022. So all you need to do is reapply for your visa, your VAC charges, the visa application charges would be waived off, and then uh, you, know, you would be able to travel to Australia without paying any visa application charge. For the airline, for the national carrier, the government initially announced a direct grant of almost $800 million. That's almost 4,000 crore uh, in, in, in rupees that was offered to Qantas. Recently, there's a campaign called Half Price Airfares, uh, and where the government is providing tickets, airline tickets at 50% of the price to almost over 800,000 individuals so that they can travel domestically within, within Australia. For the travel agents fraternity, they've launched a $130 million program providing grants, uh, depending on the size of size and volume of the business of various travel agents, the inbound tour operators and the wholesalers. For the business events or the MICE community, you know, as we as we call it in India, there's a $50 million exhibitor grant program. Another interesting initiative undertaken by Tourism Australia is a program called National Experience Content Initiative, wherein almost 1,800 tourism products are able to now develop their brochures, their digital content, their images, their videos, and this will be completely taken care of by Tourism Australia. So supporting almost 1,800 products and experiences uh, is, is what uh, you know Tourism Australia is currently doing. There's also a voucher scheme which was announced. So every uh, individual citizen or rather there was a fixed amount of vouchers uh, which were allocated by the various states there were hundred dollars and two hundred dollar vouchers which could be redeemed on your hotel stay on your restaurant dining on your holidays that you could you know that that you could redeem and lastly most importantly there's a 40 million dollar fund that was created for the indigenous uh, you know tourism community just to support the support the local community so they haven't they have literally covered every aspect of travel and 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 that's the reason you know it's uh, the country is is definitely back on its growth track and and hopefully uh, likely to open its borders to other countries who who declare themselves covid free or maybe are able to travel with a proper vaccine very interesting ishan having uh, now traversed the region with all our uh, overseas guests we will head back home uh, to miss brar and uh, Ma'am, tell us a little bit uh, about what the government did here. We were obviously fairly uh, impacted, uh, but I think we dealt very well with the first phase of the pandemic, given that we had limited infrastructure and, um, you know, we have a fairly large population. Uh, we sort of managed to do uh, well in the first phase. And uh, let's talk a little bit about um, how the government, um, you know, supported the travel and tourism industry. 
Thank you, Mandeep, and thank you, IMC. And um, I think it's just almost juxtaposing after Australia, in in a sense, a study in contrast. <laughs> and whether we talk of social distancing or whether we talk of any other aspect, so it's so it's interesting that one is speaking after Australia. Uh, yes, it has been uh, very very challenging given the the size of the country, given this the the diversity and the entire uh, socio-economic uh, spectrum that we have in India and the topography, everything, everything just makes it so much more challenging. And also an early understanding that perhaps we may be just about spared, but that of course turned into a despair when the first uh, traveler came in from Italy and there was a growing understanding that here we are going to be facing something unprecedented, that it was going to be so unprecedented, I don't think anybody was even looking at it in that sense, if we look back in late February or early March. Yes, and therefore the most uh, critical first thing was to make sure that everybody was safe. And I think the most uh, you know interesting learning at that point for all of us, and uh, considering that there was also a period when India does get a lot of foreign tourists. Typically from October to March is when we get a lot of foreign travelers. So there were still a lot of people in India at the time when lockdowns um, were announced. And therefore the first most important challenge was to make sure that everybody who was spread out all over the country needed to be kept safe and needed to be sent back to their homes if they so choose to do. And if they did want to stay back in India and extend their visas and extending that kind of support and creating a, an emotional comfort when you are away from home was the most uh, primary thing to do for us in tourism. And we set up something called the Stranded in India and we look back upon it as a success story in the sense that everybody who was out of their homes and traveling in our country found support mechanisms through that platform and went back home and then there were some who actually chose to stay back here saying that it was they felt safer to be in india than to be traveling to some parts of europe because europe was reeling at that point of time but uh, at the same time was also the immense distress that was visible in the entire industry with travel stopping entirely for a nation where we have direct and indirect employment almost close to 13 percent coming from tourism and hospitality it is, uh, it is a tough, tough journey. And I'm, I'm using the word is and not just was because uh, as we talk and, uh, and we heard our friend from Thailand, they've been through the second and the third wave now. And currently as I talk here, we are perhaps witnessing also something, I don't know whether to call it the second or the third wave, but clearly a second wave. And uh, so the last year, the calibrated understanding of how much do we need to unlock down and where has also been a matter of great challenge given the size and the diversity of the country. So we kept talking to state governments, we started talking to the provinces, started talking to the trade, and it was always a tough bullet to bite, so to say, because you know you need to create jobs, you know you need to open the sector, but there is just no point in going two steps ahead and three steps back. So it's, it's right. a really, really a cracker of a year, if we may call it, because we did try to harmonize the protocols as time went by and domestic tourism started showing a fledgling growth somewhere in late September, early October with the road travel and nearby travel picking up and people actually heading out in campus, people actually choosing to work from, not from home, but work from mountains and heading to Uttarakhand and Himachal, the northern parts of India, which are closer to the Himalayas. So, so that kind of uh, reopening and also an understanding on our part that whereas one way to support the industry is to give direct support, but the other way to do is to create demand. And that's where the good part of India seemingly uh, is there and uh, the, the size of the domestic market. And given the fact that most Indians are also not able to travel out of India currently with most countries still not uh, letting inbound travel really happen is a huge opportunity is something that was pretty clear early on. And uh, it's, it's really heartening to see that in many parts of India, the domestic travel has truly kicked in. I just got back from Kashmir yesterday and 
it was tough getting rooms even for us and so we had to spread out over four hotels in in Srinagar itself all hotels from Pehalgam reporting Chakablog, Gulmag reporting Chakablog and that's music to the ears if you look at northeastern parts of India if you look at um, a lot of uh, lodges around the sanctuaries the wildlife parks so working on the I think the domestic part of tourism has been an important part of strategic uh, I wouldn't say a paradigm shift but a recognition of a vertical that was so potential and something that we were perhaps not working with so much strategy but letting it grow more organically so I think that's been one uh, important working last year in terms of direct support, I wish I had as much to say as Nishan did, but uh, but yes, the MSME definitions have included tourism and hospitality, and we are trying to create more outreach for that because there is perhaps not enough information. The ECLGS has tried to help the mid and the larger uh, corporates that had loan liabilities on them. But yes, as uh, my friend from Sri Lanka said, you know, how much might the government may do on this front, the, the impact of the pandemic has been so immense, so immense, that it is going to take a while for us to, you know, sort of work on it. And at the same time, the review of when should visas be open? We've been having a discussion almost every month with the Ministry of Home and External Affairs as I said, it is very tempting. And the moment the numbers started going down a bit, it was very tempting that should we just go ahead and open. But the cost benefit analysis of doing anything which would then require to be taken back showed us that no, it made no sense unless we were very sure that we were able to beat the pandemic, not only for ourselves, but also for anybody who comes from another country. And that kind of confidence went missing because of the Brazilian strain and the UK strain. And uh, in some senses, we are perhaps witnessing a research because of the kind of spread that is happening now from, from whatever that we have uh, figured out from the health ministry is that the spread of this virus is far more in terms of the speed at which it actually transmits. So yes, I think time still to be very, very cautious, very, very careful. Domestic travel is kind of sort of holding us and it is holding us more in the non-metro cities naturally because it's not the large events, the large exhibitions that cannot happen for now. But the smaller properties, the boutique hotels, the homestays, they have been witnessing a good demand uh, away from the metros, um, the small places outside Mumbai, the Lonavlas and the Karjats have all been showing good demand, similarly out of Bangalore. But, but time right. to be extremely careful, extremely cautious, and, and I think we will uh, wait and watch on how to really take everything forward. So you're, you're so right, domestic tourism has been the knight in shining armor, uh, and that's the one I think which will see us through, if at all. Uh, thankfully, we have a very, very large domestic tourism travel uh, numbers. So um, I'm going to move to you, Rohit, and I'm not coming to you the last for any specific reason. It's just that uh, we've been so battered and bruised, we've lost our voice. You're probably the last man standing. So we, we're going to speak to you to tell us about hospitality and uh, how did IHCL sort of uh, cope up with it and, and how did the industry deal with uh, what I think is the most devastating event in the history of uh, hotels and hospitality. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jamal and IMC for having me here and thank you, Mandeep. Uh, I want to start by, you know, everybody's talking about bad news, bad news. So I think we've been through a nice festive period and everybody in the, on, on the panel here has, has something to celebrate in the last week or 10 days. So a uh, happy Songkran uh, to uh, Mr. Sri Sampan and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Besak uh, and uh, Besakhi to you, uh, Mandeep and uh, Ramadan Karim to uh, Mr. Jamal and Subh Avrudu Alutha Veva to Ms. Manando. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a time of celebration also. So I want to uh, twist this a little bit because, uh, you know, uh, I know we are in a very serious situation, but uh, we need to have, be cautiously optimistic about the future. And I think as an organization, that is what we looked at. Um, uh, there was bad news all around. And, uh, and uh, we believed in, uh, in a simple saying that with every crisis is an opportunity. Uh, so we try to see that what can we do in a situation where things are locking down, travel is, is getting restricted, and, and how can we make 
do business when none exists. So it basically meant a re-looking at, uh, at the book and, uh, and going back to school, but unfortunately going back to school doesn't work because nobody in college ever taught us how to make money when your top line is zero. Uh, so the top line was zero for everybody. So in the business, it was a very difficult situation. Obviously, we looked at our costs and we looked at uh, how we can drive top line through various um, um, initiatives. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that when things are down and out, one needs to you know, positively look at what can we do to survive. And I think as, as the industry, the first thing that we did was to come together. So I must say, and I must compliment uh, the entire colleagues in the industry, uh, whether it was under the ages of CII or whether it was under the ages of uh, Hotel Associates of India or WTDC or Faith, everybody just came together and had a common voice, which was something that was missing in our industry for many, many years. And, and that allowed us to have a common set agenda, you know, of three or four priorities that we wanted the government to address for us. And working along with the government uh, helped us in this manner because rather than having disparate set of requirements, we had very focused set of requirements. And I think like Ms. Brar said, the MSME um, um, benefit that was given to us in terms of moratoriums, that helped in certain states. Uh, we got industry stages that helped us on, uh, on electricity and utility bills. In certain states, we got uh, waivers on property taxes and on extension of uh, license fees. Uh, waivers, uh, force measure clauses coming in. So there was a lot of participation between public and private. And I think in a crisis coming together and having a common agenda is what helped the industry. Coming to our organization, IHCL, uh, we very quickly realized that this was something that we've never seen before and nobody really had the answers. So we, we came up with a strategy called Reset. Uh, and uh, Reset was a strategy that basically looked at uh, revenue streams uh, and driving top line at, at a time like this, uh, looking at excellence and uh, safety being a very important thing at this point in time uh, with COVID and traveler confidence quite shaken. That was important. Uh, spend optimization, looking at your variable fixed costs was important. Uh, effective asset uh, management, and that was also very important. And thrift and financial prudence. Because ultimately, you know, like Ms. Broad mentioned, about 12 to 13 percent of the uh, direct or indirect workforce in, in, in our country is related to travel and tourism. And, and therefore, we have a responsibility towards them and towards the community. So we worked on the reset strategy as, as an organization. And I think um, uh, together as a team, uh, we came up with a lot of creative and innovative ideas. But the first and most important focus was on safety. And I think uh, that is something that is, that is I, I could hear from everybody. Uh, you know, there are certifications in Sri Lanka, there are certifications in, in Indonesia, uh, there are certifications in Thailand. Now, I think luckily, um, Australia doesn't need certification uh, because they're all safe anyway. So, so they were, they, they, there are certifications also available in India, which the government had, had launched, and we are all participating in that. Uh, safety is very critical. And we launched something called Tajness, a commitment we strengthened, which was on the four pillars of, you know, of uh, sanitization, hygiene, uh, physical distancing. And I say physical distancing because in our industry, if you say social distancing, we'll be shut forever. So our, our industry is a social industry, the hospitality and tourism industry. So physical distancing, yes, uh, uh, we, we focused on that. And also on uh, the usage of pers personal protective equipment. Uh, you know, just having a policy was not good enough. You know, you need somebody to enforce it. So we had something called the COVID Marshall app in our properties or across where uh, people were going around who were trained and were recording any uh, anybody who's not really, uh, you know, following the COVID guidelines, whether they were staff or whether they were guests. So this helped us to kind of keep, um, keep the pandemic at bay. However, uh, we also saw what Ms. Brad mentioned, and I'm sure that uh, Ms. Manalo also uh, noticed that in Sri Lanka, where we have, a, uh, we have three hotels, uh, that there was a new travel that started in domestic travel, which was you know, leisure and pleasure travel. And I think that is something that, uh, a new word called pleasure. And that was people are sitting in a, in a, in a, in a nice uh, resort in, in Thiog and Simla, or they were sitting in Rishikesh on the banks of the river Ganges, and they were actually working out of there uh, remotely. 
Uh, so the family was taken care of. Everybody was away from the pandemic. They were out in the fresh air, open air, and were still they were connected to work. I think the whole role that technology play, played in this pandemic to connect everybody helped us with starting this new business, which is the pleasure business that we have. Staycations became another very important uh, way in which we started regaining business because uh, people were sick and tired of being in their houses and they wanted to just get a break and then they moved into hotels. So like Ms. Brad said, leisure hotels did very well, but city hotels are a challenge because, you know, uh, what do you do in a city? So staycations is what we launched. The point I'm trying to make is that in every crisis, there will be some opportunity. And if we are positively searching for that opportunity, I think we can find business. Uh, um, uh, we have to stick to the basics. We have to ensure that we stick to our values. We, we have to be, uh, we have to ensure uh, complete stakeholder management and take everybody together. In the end, we are a private business enterprise and we are committed to our uh, shareholders and our stakeholders. And therefore, in order to come up off and out of this crisis was a top priority for us. And I think we did a reasonably good job in the first phase. The second uh, wave is on and that has created uh, obviously a lot more uh, complication today, the speed at which it has spread, the rate uh, at which it is, uh, you know, the infections are going up. It is a cause of concern. Uh, lockdowns, temporary partial night curfews, uh, put a, a little bit of a call. Uh, and and I, can, I, can, I, can, I can imagine that that is very important. We totally support the government because at this point of time, the safety of the citizens is paramount. And, uh, and we as industry uh, work hand in hand with the government to ensure that this pandemic is put to, uh, put to bay. So um, in conclusion, we are uh, cautious, but we are also optimistic. Cautious optimism it is. Uh, and uh, Rohit spoke about a few of the sort of new trends that happened in uh, hospitality, um, you know, whether it's pleasure or staycation. Uh, let's talk a little bit, you know, as the world changed and, uh, you know, as people experienced, uh, you know, a, a significant change in their day-to-day -day lives, um, new trends seemingly emerged in, in as much as travel and tourism is concerned. Uh, let's talk a little bit in this section about what trends you think are sort of here to stay, even post-pandemic. Uh, and let me go first to uh, Kun uh, Vashirachai. Uh, to talk about what do you think are some of the trends which have emerged and which you think are now going to stay permanently or at least for a significantly long period of time. Okay, thank you very much. But first, of, I would like to just add a little bit regarding about domestic tourism, um, just to share information with you. When we're talking about domestic, it's not just domestic like Thai troll within Thailand, right? Um, I think same in every country when we focus on this. We did a lot of Categorize. So, so again, it's like back us to Mr. Rohit say, there is always an opportunity. So what we have been looking at during that time, so we promote more on the, the, the retirement because they control every, every day and they got money. The new group that we focus more is the vacations. You know, like people are getting tired stayed, as you say. So they travel to down to like Phuket and, you know, working from there with our technologies. Other group, very important ones, those high spending Thai who always go to travel outside, you know, to other countries during, during this, that difficult time, they cannot travel in and out easily. So we promote this group a lot and they are the high spenders. So that also fill up all the gap of the hospitality. So this group always go up five or six star hotels as well. So it's, it's really helping every group. Last one, we're also looking at those expats the foreigner who are in Thailand, which is huge amount. So, so this, this, this is also really driving the, the domestic tourism in the country. So, so this is, I think, something that I could be share and it's it quite done quite well in maintaining the, the throw in the industry in Thailand to be moving, you know, constantly. Okay, back to you, what you're asking me is on this. Um, I, I think once it might not be my own idea, but I do agree that the one that will be here for a long time, that would be uh, people who are thinking more about the environment, the green tourism, responsible tourism. Actually, you know, we, we have been talking about this about 20 years already, but I think the trend is, is, is more back and 
giving more importance. Um, you know, when people are traveling, now they will probably select, you know, safety of course, and then uh, what, what that destination is giving back to the environment or the social. So I think that this one would be something very important um, that every destination, every business, you need to, to, to have this as an added value. So, so this is uh, one of the, the, the thing that I would like to, to, to give to you. Other things is, would be like the added values, you know, like how the experience that giving, I think we need to, to keep more like immense, like um, when tourists trolling to any historical place or any place, they always want like to have more story. What is behind, you know, to get more immense. So I think this, this is something that we become more important and people, especially tourists are looking forward to. So this is what I, I would like to share with the panel. Surely, um, I, I, sustainable tourism is certainly something that uh, seems to have caught uh, a lot of people's fancy in, in the post-pandemic um, world. Uh, Sigit, uh, would you also like to talk a little bit about what you think are some trends which you think are going to stay? Yes, yes, of course. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes, of course, we project that uh, the things uh, already been changing. Yeah, the condition will not be uh, the same as before. So we project that the uh, new new travel pattern, new new kind of tourism uh, trip will uh, will will be adjust uh, adjusted. Uh, people will not go in lot of group. People has tend to be smaller, yeah, selected, yeah, and also selected destination. That is why uh, mostly what we have been uh, prepared and done in Indonesia mostly is uh, preparing our destination. As you know, Bali is main destination. We prepare Bali, yeah, including for India market, yeah not uh, i think for all the market yeah bali is uh, very much important and then we have also five super priority destination as you may heard about that that we have uh, tobalik in north sumatra we have uh, borobudur in central jawa and we have mandalika close to bali and also laban ajo in east nusa tenggara and we have another one in north sulawesi lukol likupang i just uh, uh, been uh, from there and we did, uh, uh, mentioned uh, our colleague from island mentioned about uh, expat we we have done farm trip with the uh, community uh, com community of uh, expat here in uh, indonesia they are uh, from chinese and we also like to tap uh, this kind of activity yeah because uh, we need to to have a new breakthrough new segment like uh, for japan we will uh, try to do with for ladies market for india i, I believe honeymoon is still still to be uh, uh, need to pursue and then uh, also other like uh, for china we, we will do for uh, more for middle up like luxury sector so that we what we pursue for the future is more for sustainable you you mentioned about that and quality tourism yeah because people will not be uh, in in a uh, lot of quantity but more for quality that we pursue that is again we prepare our destination with the cssi uh, health protocol as well as we are now very much uh, active in vaccination program this is part of the effort of uh, Indonesia government to gain uh, trust and also building confidence not only for future uh, tourists from uh, other countries but for Indonesia themselves yeah we need to uh, uh, gain confidence from them because we are now uh, already been uh, for domestic tourism yeah since last year mid last year and then uh, the impact is uh, is quite good for java yeah, but not so much for bali so that is why we uh, still a lot to do for bali destination and also we 
uh, pursue at the destination that are potential you see we have uh, close to Singapore we have uh, Rio Island Batam Bintan which is, which is uh, our second or third gate for uh, incoming tourists and we have also at the potential uh, destination that we are also need to take care but most important thing we need to make sure that the ending of the pandemic is the first concern from for us sure thank you that's uh, yeah that's very interesting on uh, all the work that you're doing to promote some of these destinations um miss fernando sri lanka has i think some of the finest small boutique hotels spread around the length and the breadth of the country um, as a trend are you seeing these being um, you know with higher occupancies uh, during the pandemic and are there any other trends that you are noticing uh, in sri lanka which are sort of emerged from the pandemic and which you think are here to stay sure i think the change in the mindset of the international traveler started long before covid uh, with the online travel agents people looking to be with the community experience something unique i think in sri lanka perhaps we didn't uh, acknowledge that and embrace that enough and now with covid that slap bang on your face now you cannot ignore that fact anymore so i think the mindset of everybody including ourselves has changed uh, we found that uh, very high net worth individuals are also coming to sri lanka now on their private jets and so on looking to have unique really unique experiences i mean we had a case where a russian uh, gentleman and his family came he actually hired the whole train because we wanted the social distancing and the bio bubble kept maintained and we said that there are certified hotels and the bio bubble has to be maintained so in the end he actually had the whole uh, train to have that uh, distance so there are people who are really willing to experience something with it is a unique ayurveda with its uh, food uh, with its um, the, you know of course the wildlife which india also is uh, famous for uh, the plantations and so on people are willing to pay and have something unique so this cookie cutter products is no longer going to work sustainability has been spoken about and bashed about for years and years and i think a lot of people didn't take it that seriously use that as a marketing tool but really uh, irrespective of what the consumer wants or not from a sri lankan perspective we actually put that as a requirement for new projects uh, so there's a you know zero uh, plus anyway zero plastic uh, single use plastic is banned already but uh, several initiatives with this is renewable energy and so on we are insisting for new projects actually so let's so you are using this kind of as opportunity also to uh, this thing another one is reaching the consumer i think from a sri lankan's perspective we didn't reach the consumer enough in the past it's been going for travel shows and whatever very focused on that which is fine that is also necessary but i think we need to reach the consumer more so we had like uh, online sort of live streaming of our wildlife for nine days in seven million followers overseas just following the live streaming so so all that i think we are using to reach the consumer much more even our certified hotels we are sponsoring those and we are going to the source markets and we are promoting actual hotels and experiences which we never ever ever did that before so it's in a way an opportunity we are changing a little bit uh, the way we are doing things we are not focusing just on a country whether it is india or uk or whatever we are looking at experiences we are making the organization cutting it in a different way uh, so yeah i think the consumer has changed we have all changed and i think that uh, you know you could make this an opportunity to get uh, get going and using technology we are launching actually we are going ahead with the tender for a new travel app we don't have a travel app uh, we've studied all the travel apps in the world uh, found out what the good features are so we have done the tender now uh, very soon which will go out and we will have a travel app unique for sri lanka which will really cater so yeah i think the consumer has changed and we need to embrace it and we could thrive sri lanka unlike some of our countries our colleagues on the uh, meeting today we've never really gone for mass scale tourism we only have 2.3 million the height of tourism so for us we are not looking for millions and millions of tourists so we are wanting to keep our island sort of not with too many tourists so we are working with railways upgrading carriages we are looking at sea gear working with them to make it a sustainable destination yeah so great opportunity i think to reset uh, sri lanka tourism and give a better product uh, for the consumer and the indian market i tell you 
it's a really critical market i'm so sorry to hear what's happening for covid at the moment for you but you will get out and i pray for that for you all of you uh, we signed um, uh, the, the travel bubble agreement with your government only a few week a few days ago after following up uh, and this happened but we have patience we wait for our uh, uh, brothers and sisters in india to recover and then uh, we are really looking forward to welcoming all of you here thank you very much uh, ms fernando for those kind words Ms. Brar, uh, just quickly talking about the same subject on emerging trends. Have you noticed anything that you think is going to stick and something that we'll see in the longer term uh, as a trend which may not have been there earlier and emerged more out of what happened during the pandemic? I think only one trend which we see which would perhaps uh, surely stay in fact is the the smaller units, the smaller hospitality units, particularly the the B and B and the homestay variety, is definitely going to be here to stay. Because in a sense, it's also a paradigm shift in how you look at life itself. And I think it has thrown open an opportunity for all those people who don't necessarily need to sit in structured office environment. And uh, if it was more of an inertia which kept you going to that office frame. Here, you've actually been given an opportunity to go and work very differently. And you realize that the dongle is perhaps the only thing that you need with you. And I think that is a trend that is likely to stay because there is a whole sense of complete wellness about one's life because you are working from home. And at the same time, you're able to do a lot of things that you would otherwise love to do. You could just get up and bake something. You could just go and do a little quick gardening. Not to say that you would still not work uh, with a focus, but it just allows you to own up your own life a little bit more. And I think that is perhaps a trend which is um, in India, we, we do believe is likely to stay. And also because there is enough opportunity to, to exploit that. There are still, while we look at very dense population areas, however, within India also, there are sufficient tracts that are not so dense. And so it's a great opportunity in a sense, I would look at it like that, that where we can decongest and we can actually move back from the highly congested urban areas to working and staying in these. So that, that's one trend one definitely sees is likely to stay. And, um, the other, of course, is also the whole thing about the experiential bit. While that was also picking up, it was picking up in terms of the customer satisfaction as to when you went, did you just want to see a, a hard a monument there? To actually going and living the life of a local is something that is fascinating the Indians also about their own country, interestingly. It's not just about the inbound coming, but the realization that if I'm moving from one state or one district or one province to another and I'm experiencing an entirely different um, you know, story about how they live, how they talk, how they dress, the kind of music that they listen to. So the immersive experiences and the need for those is also something that we are seeing a huge uh, growth in. And that's something I'm sure is also going to stay because if we see the kind of content that is coming on digital media, we are also developing that kind of content and also the kind of demand that there exists in the market for that kind of content. And the, also the role of doing things themselves, you know, is something which is an increased focus. So earlier, if you were happy to just watch somebody else make that mural, you actually want to stand there and paint and draw yourself. So I think those are some of the changes which are definitely going to stay. And uh, in that, we see a lot of potential for a country like India, which is totally, totally powered by tangible and intangible heritage. And that's an area we haven't really worked on in a very systematic manner. And in times to come, in fact, it's a very exciting opportunity, if I may say so. While uh, currently, yes, COVID is dampening a lot of things, but in terms of preparing ourselves for times to come, I think it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. And we kind of sort of sit on a cusp in how to leverage on all the diversity that we talk about in India. Absolutely. Um, I think the whole move to um, sort of have a differentiated experience and experiential stays, I think, is, is, is uh, gaining ground. Uh, Roy, does that mean music to your ears? And as much as AMA is concerned, uh, is that seeing some really exponential growth? 
Yes, uh, thank you. In fact, uh, it's so interesting that all the trends that have been spoken uh, till now are actually something that we've already uh, working on uh, over the last uh, mo maybe more than two years, and uh, COVID just kind of hastened yeah. that. Uh, so, uh, if we if we look at uh, you know sustainable tourism, obviously very big immersive travel, like um, uh, Ms. Brar mentioned, uh, very important, uh, and also homestays and uh, like you uh, rightly mentioned, our AMA brand. Uh, we have seen an exponential growth in in in, uh, in people who like to tie up with our brand and offer their products to us, and um, uh, we we are hoping that we will be very soon. Uh, operating over 100 homestay products uh, in, in the subcontinent. Uh, another thing that is as a, as a trend that has come up uh, and when we spoke about, you know, sustainable tourism and immersive experiences, uh, as you're aware, we run uh, something called Taj Safaris, which are, our, you know, uh, safari lodges in, uh, in our, uh, you know, national parks. Um, for immersive experience that as Prahal was mentioning, we have uh, uh, you know, the Pardi experience, you know, the Pardi tribe stays there and they were previously known to uh, being, you know, uh, going after killing tigers, etc. For, for various purposes, but now they have very good tracking instincts. So we, um, we have trained them to become, you know, uh, uh, you know, naturalists and guides for us and, and they take our guests into the jungle, like how a tribe would walk. So you basically, it's all about creating those immersive experiences that is totally differentiating uh, you from the humdrum of the whole pandemic and taking you away into a different world. Uh, um, uh, one thing that I must say that has taken off well, and I think this is one example, uh, is, is um, you know, everybody talks about digital, but the real thing is going to be digital because digital is what is really helping us today in the mice segment. And we have a product, uh, uh, Cumin, uh, Cumin is our you know, um, a home delivery app in which we host um, uh, digital conferences and we also provide uh, you know, uh, meals during the conference. So the meals are simultaneously delivered across the country uh, and into locations of people, allowing uh, conferencing to take place and people to experience a, a, a conference, an event, a convention, at the same time that the hospitality of of, of the Taj. So I guess, I guess uh, you know, how we can see a, uh, an opportunity, how we can latch onto an opportunity and, uh, and rather than fighting it and saying that, you know, digital will take away mice, I think it is how you build on digital and, uh, and help you grow. And, and I guess that's, uh, that's what the emerging trends uh, for us are. Our resorts have done exceedingly well, um, whether there's a Korg in Bakel and Rishikesh uh, and, and, uh, and also, like I mentioned, in uh, Safari Lodges, Ms. Bra mentioned about uh, Srinagar, and obviously, yes, we, we are very grateful that there's a lot of domestic travel uh, to take care of that. But the emerging trend going forward is one, domestic for us for the next six to 10 months, if not more. And the second would be sustainable, immersive experiences. And the third would be combination of physical and digital mice events. So lots of new vocabulary during COVID. Uh, digital uh, being added to that, as well as vacation some time ago, and there are, there are several others. But Nishant, we'll move to the sort of last section as we're running out of time. Um, and I want to talk a little bit in the last section about how each one of you sees uh, the future of travel. Um, and the one thing that I'd like all of you to talk about, um, you know, briefly, is when do you think we are going to see a sort of normal coming back uh, what's that timeline that you see? Are we, are we sort of, is this whole vaccination drive across the world going to sort of uh, propel that, you know, the communication we've been reading about uh, vaccination passports, is that going to become probably the most important travel document uh, that we need to have as we go further? Just a quick wrap up on what you think uh, is going to happen to travel? What's the sort of crystal gazing in as much as all of you are concerned? Uh, and, and what do you think will happen, um, you know, in terms of some trends on one of them being this whole thing about, um, you know, vaccination passports? We'll start with you, Nishant. All right. Uh, I guess first and foremost, uh, travel is here to stay. It's not going to stop and it's never going to stop. So uh, this has been the Sunrise industry. And whilst... Uh, you know, it was the first industry to stop uh, functioning as soon as we got into COVID. I guess uh, the segment has got the potential to bounce back and bounce back pretty, pretty rapidly. Uh, from a tourism Australia perspective, the future is quite optimistic. You know, 
pre-COVID, India was the fastest growing inbound market for tourism Australia for three consecutive years across all the 15 international markets that we're present in. We have achieved six consecutive years of double-digit growth, not just in arrivals, but also spent by Indian tourists. And whilst the Indian outbound travel industry grew by almost 8%, arrivals into Australia grew by almost 16% year on year. So we are growing at a rate which was double the uh, double the rate of the Indian, Indian outbound travel industry. So we have set ourselves uh, quite a lot, uh, quite an ambitious task, and we believe that this India could be in the potential of uh, you know achieving one billion one million visitor arrivals into Australia over the next decade or so. Uh, there's an India economic strategy that uh, that was unveiled by the Australian government, and it's primarily to focus on India as a market, not just for tourism but also for trade, education, agriculture, you know, maritime security, and and other you know there is quite a few MOUs which have been signed between the two prime ministers. Uh, at the recently held virtual bilateral summit that was attended by Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So the future is quite optimistic. And what we're doing at this point of time uh, at Tourism Australia are three things. Uh, first thing that we're doing is to keep the lights on. Uh, it's been 12 months since we haven't had a single tourist uh, who have visited Australia, but we have been uh, through a content and social amplification initiatives, we have been trying to keep the lights on, keeping Australia's attractiveness right up there in the consideration set of a high value travelers. We have been engaging with the tourism industry at both ends. Uh, we have a program called the Aussie Specialist Agents, where we have trained almost over 18,000 agents during this particular pandemic. On the consumer front, when the Indian cricket team traveled to Australia uh, for the Bolivar series and the series that we won, uh, there are a lot of interesting initiatives which were undertaken. We partnered with a lot of uh, OTT platforms. We worked with a lot of influencers and advocates to raise the profile of Australia. So we will continue to keep the lights on. And, you know, Australia today enjoys the highest intention and consideration amongst the Indian travelers. So that's the first thing that we're doing. The second thing that we're doing is keeping ourselves ready to launch as soon as, uh, you know, the borders open. So we are launching new products, new experiences and new destinations within Australia that would resonate amongst the experiential, immersive Indian traveler. We're trying to seek uh, you know, develop new partnerships, partnerships with banks, partnership with credit card companies who we believe will have access to customers uh, who will have the propensity to travel to Australia as soon as the borders open. So we are keeping ourselves ready to launch as soon as the borders open. And last but not the least, what we're doing is keeping the India dream alive because India as a source market has got tremendous potential. Uh, the Modi government has got this ambition of making India a five trillion economy uh, you know, by uh, FY2025 or so. Uh, uh, as we speak, outbound travel out of India, uh, you know, it's just or leisure travel is just 4 million out of the 26 million outbound travel. So and that represents just 0.3 percent of the India's uh, of India's population. So imagine this if this 0.3 percent even doubles to 0.6 percent or even 1 percent of uh, of uh, the, of the population of the country who's able to take an international holiday. Uh, this country has got tremendous uh, potential and, and there are a lot of opportunities in this particular industry. And whether it's in terms of building your career, uh, starting your own businesses, uh, you know, this is the Sunrise industry and this is the industry for the future. Great. Ms. Fernando, your views on how it's going to pan out? The recovery? Yes, of yes I think there are three areas that we need to ensure that the traveler is reassured. From a Sri Lankan context, we have taken every single step possible to ensure that the traveler is reassured. Uh, we've got an insurance as well for $12 for one month. It covers 50,000 uh, insurance cover. Uh, so we've had experience in handling that, got complimented on it. The community needs to be reassured. So we keep uh, various programs. We go on TV. We have discussions with them to reassure them. We reassure the employees, very important, and their families. That is very important that, that we have a strict health protocol. Vaccination is going to be critical. I think UK uh, particularly has done particularly well there. And that's another area. We have a huge market uh, uh, there. So this is something we are looking forward to. We are giving opportunities to hotels to be quarantine hotels, hospitals as well. Hotels also are realizing that uh, there are areas that they need to look at, whether it is medical tourism or other areas that we will now going, going forward to look at. It is not from a Sri Lankan perspective, it's not really the numbers, it's the yield that we will look at more so, value for money, unique experience. With India particularly, you know that we are a small island, we are unique, we are compact, we have everything to offer to you and we have an amazing flight connectivity uh, with your country and ours. Uh, so, yes, um, I, I look at it absolutely positively. Sri Lanka has gone through a war for 30 years, uh, terrorism for 30 years. We've been through tsunami 
uh, we had Easter Sunday bombing. We are quite familiar with crisis. Uh, this one has been the biggest one, I think, possibly in a different way. Uh, so we are we are ready. We are meeting the challenges, and we will somehow thrive and come out of this. Absolutely, won't we all? Sigit, your views on uh, when do you think it's going to get back to normal? Yes, uh, for Indonesia, tourism is very much important, yeah, as you know. Uh, that is why we are very much concerned on the revival of tourism and creative economy in Indonesia. And for this matter, as I mentioned earlier, that we will, well, we will continue preparing our destination, hotel, restaurant, tourist attraction with CSSE health protocol. We also been active with vaccination program. We will start also start with our communication campaign. We have the timeline. We set the timeline. Then will lead to border opening, hopefully. But the, again, one of the requirement, the most important one is the handling, the way handling of the pandemic. We focus on Bali as the main destination to consider to be open first. We have three locations, Nusa Dua, Sanur, and Ubud in Bali. And then we have also uh, possible to open also in Bintan, Lagoy, and Batam, Nongsa. So this location, we've been watching and even monitoring almost every week. We have a very intense coordination with a related ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Immigration, and Ministry of Health, to make sure that everything been ready once we lead to uh, the de decision. And we hope that uh, will uh, the result will come out at the earliest convenient because our industry and tourism and creative economy been suffering for more than one year. So again, we prepare and we will see uh, as soon as possible for Indian market and also other uh, tourists from all over the world. Thank Ali. you. Kun Vachirachai, when do you think you will have 40 million tourists back in Thailand? Okay, I... So is I uh, happy to share with you that now uh, you know I got a lot of inquiry asking when Thailand is opening. So now at least what we have in our hand is our roadmap to reopen Thailand for vaccinated tourists first. Okay, so it's first by step, first by first, step by step. So start from this month, first of April. Okay, we have reduced the date of quarantines. Okay, for those who have been vaccinated, will only be seven days. Those who don't, okay, will be 10 days, okay? And then uh, what I really, and many people are looking forward is that 1st of July, we plan to open Phuket Island for vaccinated tourists without quarantines. So before we open, we need to prepare everything. Our plan is that people on the island need to be vaccinated 70% as well. So it has to be both, you know, like to ensure people within the islands and who are coming are safe, all right? And then next step is October. The major destination will be open up without quarantine for vaccinated again, tourists, including Krabi, Panga, Samui, Pattaya, and Chiang Mai. So we do it step by step on this. So this is already be announced and we are again, same as everyone optimistic, optimistic and have to be confident that we, we are going as our plan. Just to share with you, uh, India is a very huge market and very important market for Thailand and, and every other countries. Um, you know, Indian Alba, very important. And I think this is a very good spirit that you see in the past. There are always events, you know, physical or live going on. So this is something that really keep the industry for India and other countries moving as well. Um, I probably, once India's openings, we also have a lot of Thai who are looking forward to come to travel to India as well. So, so many, many Thai are also missing India, same as many Indians, I believe, are missing Thailand as well. So Correct. this is what I'd like to share with you, right? Quick question to you, and I'm going to ask this across the panel. Do you think 
you will have normalcy in your travel or you know in global travel in one year two years or three years just one answer normalcy right i think that might be happening crossing my fingers by 2022s i believe according to our roadmap as well i think people could be easily traveling this year but there probably would be a lot of protocol you know applying for visas when in the country maybe you still have to you know the outward right. application that type of stuff so the 2022 is your answer i think that would be my personal answer yes okay rohit coming to you uh in terms of the answer you're talking about when are we see a recovery yeah Okay, well, uh, you know, first I think we need to stabilize the situation, uh, and uh, to be very honest, I think we are going a little bit up and down and in stability. We we were making good progress till this uh, current wave hit us. So I think uh, you know, international travel for India to recover requires a couple of things to be put in place. Uh, one is you know safety protocols, uh, vaccination uh, drives, etc., to ensure the similar thing like you're talking about Phuket. Uh, you know, have a buy bubble kind of situation which encourages people and give you know, uh, to travel. I think technology and communication play a very key uh, key role in promoting uh, India as a destination. Well, we would like to work uh, at a PPP model with the government and you know look at uh, promoting incredible India uh, the, with diverse and Im immersive experiences. I think if you have to get do some things, and only then can you get the result. And I think uh, uh, we feel that. Uh, by around uh, this has been a setback. I would have said 2022 to you earlier, but now I, I don't think it's going to be 2022, uh, considering the current wave and by the time it stabilizes and you know markets change. I would say uh, 2023 is when uh, I see international tourism. I'm not talking about domestic. I'm talking about international tourism uh, resuming in India. Uh, you know, uh, basically. Uh, uh, Indian hospitality encapsulated in, in what we call Tajness, which you feel with your eyes closed. We believe that a lot of people are waiting to experience that. Absolutely. Last word to you, Ms. Brad. I, I wish I had a crystal ball there, but um, it, look, it, it looks tough for now. It looks tough for now for next year to be absolutely normal. But yes, a lot of travel will inch back. That's also a fact because uh, hopefully if a few months go by when the pandemic is not so evident and on the surface, people are reaching to travel. There is no question on that. People are wanting to travel. And I think it's an intrinsic human trait to travel. And that's why they say that humans were not born with roots, but feet. So, so hopefully that instinct will get people back to travel. But late 22 would look at a, a large number, but coming back to normalcy, might be looking at 23, Septus Paribus. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's been a wonderful discussion that we've spent a little over an hour talking about some great thoughts some great views here. Uh, I think the takeaways are several, uh, but the larger one that I see is that travel is very, very intrinsic to all our lives. It isn't going anywhere, neither is this industry. We're only waiting uh, impatiently to be able to travel. Uh, all kinds of digital stuff may happen, but the need for us to actually travel uh, is absolutely, you know, deeply uh, ingrained in our DNA as humans. So that's not going anywhere. It probably will take a little longer than we probably thought. Uh, specifically, I'm, I'm talking at the moment of India, but in some countries like Australia, I see that coming back a little more quicker, given, and even in Sri Lanka, given that their cases are limited. Um, but in any case, we're saying by the end of 22 or middle of 23, we hope to see a world which is getting back to normal. We've discovered new things. We've discovered the sustainability angle, you know, when everything got shut down and we saw a world which was very different, which was very pristine, the, you know, the tree, the flowers look prettier, the, the, the trees look greener and we want that world back. Uh, so there's going to be work on sustainable travel. There's going to be work on bubbles that are going to be created between countries, even in domestic travel. I think boutique leisure will be something that everybody will be looking at to stay in smaller, more intimate places. Lots of stuff emerging. We're going through a very difficult time. Everyone has dealt with it, um, you know, uh, from, you know, uh, very, very bravely. Countries have fought back and continue to fight back, some more successful than the others. But the bottom line is, we're all waiting to travel and we can't wait to get onto a trip as soon as we can. 
ladies and gentlemen it's been uh, my extreme pleasure uh, to talk to all of you uh, thank you very much for being here thank you for sparing the time and all your views uh, which have enlightened the audience i would imagine farad back to you uh, thank you mandeep for this fabulous uh, moderation and, and great insights into what the uh, our panelists shared with everybody uh, there are a few questions that we have in our inbox and the first question if i may go ahead and just ask uh, nishant uh, entry to australia allowed for tourists from other countries and if what is required to carry also their relaxation for one who is vaccinated is 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 currently considered as a positive thing all right so uh, as we speak uh, the international borders are are shut uh indians can only travel to australia on compelling and compassionate grounds so when you apply for your visa application on the homeaffairs.gov.au website you also need to simultaneously fill up an exemption form and once the exemption form is approved and your visa is granted you would be allowed to travel to australia once you land in australia uh, you may also you will have to undergo institutional quarantine at your own cost at a pre designated uh, hotel and and therefore you know you don't have to undergo any vaccination or have to uh, undergo any additional medical tests at this at this point of time but uh, you know as we speak there are no commercial flights operating between india and australia there's no air travel bubble that existing uh, that's currently existing between the two countries so travel is only allowed on compelling and compassionate grounds okay thank you thank you thank you nishant uh, this question is for uh, ms brar um it says uh, we have a unique problem at a time when travel is important and urgent today you think of plug in stops in check especially after you know the big uh, people event like a marco uh, challenge how will you how do we strike a balance and how do you work on high value tourism that's the a- how do we work on high value tourism was that the question high high value tourism yeah i think in fact that is the focus area of the policy that is coming up on uh, striking the right balance between the numbers so the two uh, options as we look at and that's where the opportunity actually lies for us that in the past we haven't been spreading out our destinations so one idea is to spread the destinations and the development that comes up needs to be uh, of a sustainable model Uh, whether it is uh, or not only high value but i would say better value for money tourism is how we are looking at it okay and the, and just to follow up question to the same is is this a good time that can be used for by tourism offices to culturally orient the travel community with online events oh absolutely i think everything has been going online whether it is uh, domestic communication or overseas we've been having all our events pretty much only on uh, the platforms that we are talking on right now or at best doing hybrids we of course have attempted doing a few physical events off and on but the large uh, part of it making sure that the social distancing uh, is followed has largely respected the digital platforms and yes i think most of the industry is on board and everyone seems to be pretty comfortable including organizing very fancy looking conference uh, you know showcasing it and you actually feel you are entering into a physical space because i think technology and the mandarins of technology have really come up with some smart solutions and it's for all of us to work together to adopt them and uh, that is this is a question for ms ms fernando for you it says uh, uh, during post during the post pandemic the, the second wave so to say uh, the marketing support that you have given is excellent your cancellation policies and new product launches have also spurred travel further i feel your timing has been critical for your in the revival of tourism can you identify some more points which are key for revival of tourism in sri lanka i think it was uh, working in a team with other ministries uh, uh, continuous communication keeping people updated Uh, i think uh, sometimes there's a lot of noise particularly in asia there's lots of views and points of view and people criticize what you but i think you should go with what is right and, and then people figure it out because if you go to get consensus all the time so with the bio bubble concept which we came up it has been a success 
So I think uh, come up with something unique for your country that works for your country. I think that that's something that you should do for each. I mean, I saw in Indonesia now they're with Bali and so on. So each country has their own way of doing it. For Sri Lanka, we've offered the whole country is open. All nationalities are welcome, but you need to be in a bio bubble if you're not vaccinated. If you are vaccinated, it's just one night. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just your question, I suppose, as general uh, to, to all the panelists. What is the message to bolster confidence to students in hospitality courses across all countries facing the prospect of the challenging future? I mean, everybody is concerned. The students are concerned about the future, about the jobs after they do their programs. And what is the message that we would like to share with them? Ms. Proud, would you want to go first? Surely, I was going to volunteer. I think um, it, it's, a, it's a way to look at it, you know, it, and if I look back at history, being a student of history cannot but avoid going back to history that the human uh, race has been confronted by all kinds of challenges and immense ones. And when an, a challenge strikes, it is truly the most difficult time that when we live through it appears to be. But then out of challenges, not only come opportunities, but also life goes back and i think that's where when i look at particularly india or even the world the world is truly at a cusp at this point of time and there is a lot of uh, in fact there's going to be a lot of research as we may you know call for it because imagine a year year and a half of none of us being able to do what we would truly like to do so, so there is really no reason for us uh, to to kind of lose heart of that there have been world wars before this, there's been the Spanish flu before this, there have been the plague and, and whatnot. So, so I think at every point of time, if we look back, the, the mankind has found solutions and has come out and has emerged much stronger and with better solutions, in fact. So I see absolutely no reason why the student community should lose heart. It's probably a good time to learn some more skills. It's a time to invest on learning. It's a time to grow yourselves and skill yourselves up better. Better times are waiting for you. There are also, may, may I request you to just share about the success of tourism in Kashmir in the last few months or year? Yes, surely. You see, interestingly, and that's where it really, and these are those examples that actually make you feel so much more confident. When we looked at the data of the domestic traveler this year, over the last January, it's actually shown a significant increase in terms of numbers. And in uh, February, the domestic numbers were about 29,000 travelers, and March already, already has 46,000 domestic travelers. And all spectrums of the units are full, whether you are looking at the most expensive, high end, or you're looking at the really modest, simple stays, each of them is reporting full, um, full absolutely capacity. A place like Khyber, you can't get a room till 30th June. It's one of the most expensive properties in India. Oh, and amazing. people are not just sticking to their rooms, they're actually wandering around, they're traveling, they are in the gardens, they are in the shikaras, the houseboats are full. I think it's been a great learning, in fact, from Kashmir. They are, of course, the, when you land at the Srinagar airport, the rapid antigen test is mandatory. Even if you come with a test that has been done on you, they're still insisting on a rat. And I think that's what's keeping them good for now. So yes, we will need to respect a few protocols. It's in the interest of everyone, but Kashmir's story doing absolutely wonderful. The ski slopes in Gulmarg, absolutely full. The classroom at the Institute of Skiing and Mountaineering has had little children and all their sessions have gone fully attended. So some really heartening stories coming from uh, Jammu and Kashmir. That's fabulous. Absolutely. Very encouraging, I must say. I heard there were 50,000 or tourists during the, during the tulips blooming the time. Tulip festival. Tulip festival. Mr. Jamal, I had a, I had a comment. Uh, yeah, please in, do. In addition to Ms. Uh, Brar's uh, response to the please students do. who are graduating. You know, um, what happens is that this is also time to relook at options. You know, what, what is necessary, traditional hoteling is not what is going to be because hoteling in itself is changing. So, you know, with the advent of homestays and small resorts and, and niche, uh, you know, hospitality products, 
and rather than you know chasing long time established brands and you know looking at traditional careers in hospitality one needs to look at alternate careers you know if there's nothing wrong in in running a small lodge somewhere there's nothing wrong in in you know overseeing a group of lodges in 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 a, in a location at the at the same time if you're a chef it's not necessary for you to work in a in a five star hotel uh, today we have cloud kitchens which are you know uh, really coming up because of the huge demand on on uh, you know home deliveries so uh, i pursue pursue uh, uh, careers in hospitality but don't go by the trusted old fashioned system you have to open a mind and look at new avenues of of growing your careers in hospitality that's that's my suggestion to the students thank you absolutely rohit. valid one rohit very very good thank you uh, nishant you have anything to add to this i guess uh, you know both uh, ms brar and rohit has summarized it but if you look at any and every segment of travel whether it's inbound travel into india outbound travel out of uh, india or domestic travel within india itself which is almost like over 1.6 billion trips i guess this opportunity across every segment of tra of travel and as as rohit rightly said you don't have to uh, you know believe in those tried and tested methods or you don't have, don't have to you know aim and aspire to work with airlines or you have to work with some of the top tour operators in the country but you can start something on your own as well and there's tremendous potential uh, that 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 this country has to offer so yeah it's 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 all it's all good uh, the future looks quite quite promising and it's a great industry to build your uh, personal career so the last last question uh, how how does the, how do the panelists see the bubble sports tourism future sustain not sustainable because people seem to have been stopping they are still continuing without without any spectators and uh, most of the large international events even are continuing actually how do you see in, this in fact in fact farat uh, yeah. when the indian cricket team traveled to australia for the border gavaskar series there were spectators allowed in all the australian stadiums whether it's the mcg the scg the adelaide oval uh, the gabba Uh, where we won the final test match there were spectators allowed at almost over 50% capacity and and it all effectively depends on how well you manage the pandemic and the spread of the virus in your own country so safety and security is going to be extremely important uh, before allowing you know and and, and managing these uh, or organizing these large scale events so yes you it, it's a different energy altogether watching a game at the mcg and scg and you cannot replace that uh, you know by sitting in front of the television we have the uh, t20 world cup taking place in australia in uh, in 2022 october november hopefully the borders would open by then uh, but even uh the men's world cup which was slated to happen in october october and november 2020 we had already received over 20000 bookings from india 9 months before the tournament so that just you know uh, demonstrates the potential of sports tourism and watching live events in an in, uh, at an international destination that's that's brilliant actually mr fernando you had the the english cricketers in Austra in in sri lanka uh, that's correct the bubble, right That's correct. You allow we spectators? Have, yes, we are, we were allow we didn't initially allow spectators for the first few matches. We were we are quite strict about uh, uh, the bio bubble concept. So they were separately kept in separate hotels. They had a doctor with them as well. They went in the transport separately for them, and they went to the stadium and played. Um, yeah. So that that and also another area which we are now now created a one stop shop is the film tourism. This is also another area that we are. the film tourism is another area that we are looking at because there's a lot of approvals to be got so we have created we are creating as you speak a film tourism one stop shop a place where we would assist um, and interestingly when the previous question you asked about students but for sri lankan context actually the investments in tourism went up in 2020 compared to 2000 2019 so we are having the port city as well so there's more capacity coming in that is we require so there is a need for more uh, tra well trained employees in the hospitality industry okay thank you thank you mr fernando um now i think that was that was the last question that i had on on this list so i'm just opening for last comments if anybody has to make Okay, um, Shelby. Uh, yes, sir. Do you now request uh, 
Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. So as we come to the conclusion of this need of the art discussion session, may I request Mr. Ajit Mangulkar, Director General, IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry, to present the vote of thanks. Over to you, Mr. Mangulkar. Thank you, Selby. And a very, very good afternoon to ladies and gentlemen. I think this has been a fantastic interaction. I mean, to hear international experts talk about tourism and travel in this current scenario has been a really an enriching experience. At the outset, I must thank our moderator, Mr. Mandeep Lamba, and all our esteemed panelists, Ms. Rupinder Brar, Mr. Sigit, Ms. Kimarli Fernando, Mr. Nishant Kashikar, Mr. Siri Sumpan, and Mr. Rohit Khosla. I would also like to thank Mr. Bhuvanesh Khanna for his special remarks. I thank all of you all for sparing your valuable time and being with us today, and also for sharing your valuable expertise. Your presence and active participation immensely contributed to the success of this event. IMC has been instrumental in initiating such progressive interactive sessions and actively taking up issues on behalf of Indian businesses, which play a pivotal role in providing inputs on policy formation to promote the interest of the sector, community, and country at large. Today's online interaction was unique. The objective of this interaction is, was to have leaders from the travel and tourism industry from India, Australia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and Thailand, and to have a dialogue and share measures taken by each nation to rebuild tourism and enhance regional coordination for a sector that is going through its darkest hour in recent history. Encouraging news on vaccines has boosted hopes for recovery, but challenges remain. Domestic tourism has restarted, but the current second wave has come as another setback. However, real recovery will only be possible when international tourism returns. Will it be 2022? Will it be 2023? Well, we can just hope that it is as early as possible. While flexible policy solutions are needed to enable the tourism economy, to live alongside the virus in the short to medium term, it is important to look beyond this and to take steps to learn from the crisis, which has revealed gaps in government and industry preparedness and response capacity. Coordinated action across governments across the world at all levels and the private sector is essential. On behalf of IMC and its Travel, Tourism and Hospitality Committee, I wish to extend our sincere thanks to our platinum sponsor, the Indian Hotels Company Limited and supporting sponsor Concept Hospitality Private Limited, the Fern Hotels and Resorts for the confidence that they have reposed in IMC through their association with this event. I also take this opportunity to acknowledge BW Communities as our esteemed media partner for the event. I extend our sincere thanks to all our participants, business executives, members representing travel, tourism and hospitality industry for joining this event. I would also like to thank members of our IMC Travel, Tourism and Hospitality Committee, headed by Mr. Farad Jamal, for May putting this interaction together. And last but not the least, I thank our team IMC, led by Officer in Charge, Assistant Director Anup Misal, for making this event happen. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being a very, very great audience and a great interaction. Thank you to all. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Thank you, Farah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.